Good afternoon, everybody. This is the August 8th, 2024 meeting of the Cross-Sector Mitigation Subcommittee of the Vermont Climate Council. Thanks all for joining today. Um, we may get a few other additional committee subcommittee members, but um, it being summer, we are a little bit light on attendance today. Nonetheless, we have, a, um, I think, a robust agenda um, with some interesting discussion items, and we're going to just dive right in. Um, meeting logistics, um, Rich Cowart has agreed to take notes, so my co-chair, thank you for filling that role today. Um, and our first um, agenda item is to approve the minutes from July 11th. Those were sent around after the meeting. Um, does everybody, does everyone have a copy of the minutes from our last meeting? Any proposed changes or edits to those minutes? Oh, Jared, yeah. Yeah, I just noticed one thing up front. Uh, it has a list of subcommittee members, and there was a name on there that I didn't recognize as a subcommittee member who I think was actually a member of the public. The last name on there, Spencer Dole. So I think that should be changed or I just removed since we're not in the practice of listing the members of the public who attend. Thank you for catching that. Um, okay, Brian, you make that change on your end? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, okay. Good catch. Anything else on our minutes from uh, July 11th? Nope. Uh, so do we move to approve the minutes? Um, we just see a show of thumbs up to approve our minutes from the July meeting. Good. We will consider those approved. Um, okay, any um, changes to the agenda uh, that was circulated yesterday? Proposal changes. All right, um, just as you know, as chair here. Oh, great. We're getting a couple more um, members joining now. Um, as you can see, we have um, good representation from our buildings and thermal task group today, which is great. And I know we're going to get some slide presentation from that group. Um, our, most of our uh, transportation folks are not able to attend today. So I think we're going to table um, that task group update to September meeting, which will give us more time to have a focused conversation on the recommendations um, that are in the works being drafted by Buildings and Thermal. And I believe we will also expect we'll have Peter joining us to provide um, an update from the electric, the electricity task group. Um, so I think, you know, our focus will be again on the um, on the engagement and equity pieces and then um, shifting into some updates from the Climate Action Office and then getting into the uh, committee, subcommittee discussion around um, draft recommendations. Uh, and one item that I don't think ended up on the agenda, but um, we're, we're adding a quick note on um, coordination with the Rural Resilience Subcommittee, and Jane's going to cover that in her uh, Climate Action Office updates. There's some overlap between what that subcommittee handles and what our subcommittee handles, and so we'll be discussing that as well um, in our time with Jane, who's here, I think, for the first half of our meeting. So diving in, um, I think that you know the the top item at the on the agenda for substantive discussion really is um, discussing the findings from um, the engagement to date that the Climate Action Office has done around the kickoff to the Climate Action Plan. Um, we spoke last month about um, we heard report outs from folks who had attended the Climate Action Plan kickoff events, uh, and then again sent some follow up documents. Um, being the Climate Action Plan survey results. So people were able to go online and fill out a survey. Um, that Those results were in the Excel spreadsheet. I know they were a little bit difficult to digest, but I'm hoping folks have had a chance to, um, to look at those and kind of sift through specifically the, the items that touch on cross-sector mitigation. So I guess I'll pause there and, and, and ask the subcommittee, was there anything of note um, that you saw in reviewing those uh, survey results? I would just say it was helpful to have them compiled in that um, summary short format. And I know there was a longer discussion of, of the same material at the Climate Council um, already. So I don't, I, I don't have a lot to add beyond that, but just appreciate that it was shared and available for 
um, easy and well-organized reference. Yeah, thanks, Jared. And again, you know, we'll just continue to put this on the agenda as a topic um, because we're getting these these regular updates again from the Climate Action Office around the engagement work they're doing, and and really um, just encouraging folks to review those and um, and have them, you know, kind of back of mind as we look at our recommendations. Um, of course, you know, one for me in in reviewing the survey results is sometimes we're getting conflicting input. Right, there was certainly a focus on biofuels and what is the role of biofuels, what is the role of um, combustion of products in our in meeting our climate goals. So um, certainly a challenge in in terms of incorporating those the feedback that we're hearing from folks um, into the recommendations. But again, I, I do think it's important that we are all reviewing them and um, and keeping them top of mind. Um, and another document that unfortunately did not get embedded in the um, the agenda was the the summary document um, from the Climate Action Office um, from those kickoff events. Again, I, I know we touched on these last um, last time in terms of the detailed minutes, but I did I would love to just take a few minutes for folks. I just sent this at 1130 um, because it is so short. I think I'm going to pull one of David Plum's tricks and just say, let's take five minutes to review that. And um, I'd love to discuss kind of that was the high level summary of guidance um, that came out of those kickoff events. And specifically, there's one section um, for cross sector mitigation. Um, does everybody have that uh, summary document handy? And can we, um, Peter, you're shaking your head. I think, did I just, did folks get it from me recently, like this morning? Yes. Anyone who can't put their hand on that additional document, it's CAP Update Kickoff Meeting Summary, June 2024. I can resend if anyone doesn't have it. Um, I received it from you. If folks are looking kind of by time of when it was sent at 1117 this morning. And again, if we could just take, you know, five minutes, it's a three page PDF. And of course, there's there's one section specific to our subcommittee, which um, is under reduction of climate pollution. They didn't use the title cross sector mitigation because I think that confuses folks. Um, but I'd love to just spend a couple minutes on that. And if, um, yeah, and we can dive into kind of, again, how bringing this input from the public into our recommendations.
It doesn't look like I can share my screen, but I'm assuming everyone has the document in front of you. Anyone need more time? One more time. I mean, my overarching question is, you know, how does this feedback influence your thinking around our work? And I'd love to just kind of get some dialogue from the subcommittee um, on, on the things that were highlighted in those events, um, came, up, came across, I think, as high level overarching themes um, coming out of the public engagement. Yeah, Sam, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, specifically in that in that um, sort of cross sector bit, or the reduce reduction of climate pollution among the other categories, I think there are several key things that did occupy a good chunk of conversation thus far, both here and in working groups, which was nice to see, or not nice, but um, you know confirmed that um, those ha those uh, comments which have been made in the past are being taken on board in, in the process. So that's good. I'd point specifically to the conversations around supporting a workforce. Um, and sort of the navigation of, of all the different <laughs> programs, um, definitely the on-ramp for um, low and moderate income, uh, regardless of program and sort of, you know, sort of add there to maybe the simplification of that ac across the board. Um, and then, you know, it was uh, interesting and, and not unsurprising to also see that taking full advantage of federal funding opportunities of the, the landscapes going on right now. But, and, and I think the conversations that have been really interesting and productive thus far. I've also touched on um, on how complicated and sort of patchworky and and I don't want to say unstable, but uh, sort of difficult to and mismatch sometimes those are. And so having a, a, a real consciousness of that as we go forward, um, I think has been highlighted as really important. So um, those are just a few of the things that jumped out to me from the get go. Yeah, thank you. So kind of reinforcing themes that we've already been um, mulling over and, and working through. Um, and the navigators in particular stuck out with uh, to me both in the event and in the follow up. Um, I didn't see the order of hands. Um, Dave, I think you were next. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I agree with what Sam just said. I, I'm really intrigued by the weatherization core idea. It's obviously a really big idea, but um, the, the current workforce uh, challenge is a is a whopping challenge, and it's just a, it's the it's a it's a really big stumbling block. To doing what needs to happen to make so many other things fall into place wouldn't call it a prerequisite but it's sort of like a prerequisite and of course the idea of having meetings that aren't virtual that are out there where folks can see and and maybe participate a little bit more i think is always more difficult but really important great thank you and i think we're going to talk more about that last one um, later in the agenda uh Jared and Bram, sorry, I'm not sure. Go ahead, Bram, please. All right. Uh, you know, just the point you mentioned earlier, Melissa, about the fact that uh, we don't refer to ourselves always as cross-sector mitigation because it's confusing um, is consistent with what we heard about using plain language as a just transitions principle. And I wonder if we shouldn't rename our subcommittee to the climate pollution reduction subcommittee instead of cross-sector mitigation? And some nods and some heads up, uh, thumbs up. Um, I don't know if we're specifically named in, in Stetch. We are. We are, Jerry, you keep us honest with the GWSA. Um, but it is, the point is well taken, Bram. It, it does fly in the face of um, kind of the accessible language that, that we should be using. Yeah, and you know, we can be the the, climate pollution reduction, or, or we can be cross-sector mitigation doing business as the climate pollution reduction, right? Yeah. Yep, Dave's supporting that in the chat as well, also known as, um, good point, certainly publicly facing, we could um, use more accessible language. Jared, go ahead, dude. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that on those bullet points under reduction of climate pollution, I think that there are a number that are, are really um, consistent with and helpful. Um, you know, just as a preview, I know that when we discuss the, the draft thermal sector pathways and strategies uh, recommendations, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, overlap here in terms of workforce, in terms of weatherization, in terms of equity. Um, one thing I, that did stand out to me, and I, I think I brought this up on the last meeting, so um, apologies if I'm um, um, returning to this too often, but 
I, I do think it's on that second to last bullet point around transportation and focusing on non-car solutions such as electric buses and light light rail. Um, I, I really think it's important that those are included in the plan, non-car solutions, but then what those non-car solutions are, I think we need to be really um, deliberate um, about how we assess those, including, I mean, on a whole uh, uh, series of, of measures, including emissions reduction, equity, cost effectiveness. And, you know, I would just note that those two things at the end there um, end up being very different um, on a cost effectiveness perspective in terms of dollars spent per ton reduced. And, you know, given Vermont's uh, settlement pattern and our population density, um, there are going to be solutions like microtransit and cutaway electric buses and, and things that are going to be far more cost effective than than trying to build and sustain uh, really uh, heavily expensive infrastructure um, like like light rail. So in comparison, so I just and and to me that goes back to. Um, just a really important topic to bring back for our analytical underpinning, which is as part of the first climate action plan, when there was the pathways analysis done to look at not just our business as usual emissions, but the pathways to come into compliance, come in under the Solutions Act targets. Um, one of the things that was included was a marginal abatement cost curve so that we could look at the, the proposed measures in terms of the, the cost per ton reduced and which ones up front right away would save money and and which other ones um you know may not and i i think that updating both the pathways overall and that marginal abatement cost curve will be incredibly important uh to inform the relative emphasis i mean we can talk broad level about non-car solutions but within that I, I do think it's appropriate to be more specific about you know which ones are the most appropriate or the most cost effective um, because those two examples at the end are very different on that measure yeah thanks for that jared um i think that's helpful context and and you're you know resonating some of the comments gina made last time as well what we hear in the transportation space um sometimes are not necessarily the most effective uh, ghg mitigation measures and how do we reconcile public engagement public input um with really what, what the work need, that needs to be done to meet gwsa is um so certainly more conversation on this and i think this will certainly come into play um, as we take the next step early fall around prioritization of recommendations, which again, need to be prioritized based on cost effectiveness, um, mitigation potential, equity implications, et cetera. So I think our work is really cut out for us. Um, I keep coming back to, I think we've received guidance that um, the council wants to put forward maybe 10 high priorities overall uh, coming out of this subcommittee work. And, and so we will have some um, some robust conversation about, uh, about what those priorities look like. Um, so Bram, go ahead. Yeah, I think, Regarding the uh, potential tension that you and Jared have pointed out between the public's desire for public transportation, say, and the small effect that will have on reduction of climate pollution. Um, so, you know, our, our charge is very clearly to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I think it's really important that we not. Um, discard input from the public that has other meaningful benefits. And I think we can easily create an appendix to the revised cap that holds that part of the public interest that is not um, a recommendation to reduce greenhouse gas, but we are recognizing as an important public need, which was voiced by the public. Great, thank you. Yeah, good, good recommendation to make sure that those um... That input isn't lost. Sam. I'm just gonna touch on two things that are, are maybe slightly related, but uh just emphasizing in a list, um both mention uh, I guess I'm 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 looking forward to working closely with a rural resilience and adaptation group, which I I, I believe is have we're having a, a little conversation about what that might look like coming up today, if I'm not mistaken, but um both in terms of um uh, how things are implemented or could be implemented in rural communities and, and making sure that we're including rural, rural communities, which may mean looking at things that have 
maybe comparatively less um, uh, emissions benefits, but have the you know the benefit of of uh, of making the transition accessible to everybody in the state. And then also there are several points on land use that I think will be quite interesting because I I haven't seen that come up really in our um, in our discussions yet in in this committee, but do have. Um, uh, there are, are implications and connections there. So I think that will be great. And, and one minor point to this um, is just that as we assess our, our progress and also um, uh, our focus uh, for the next round of, of pathway strategies and actions, I think um, making sure we're doing that not just at a statewide, as a statewide number in any given, for any given metric or any given program, but reporting that with some geographic um, uh, specificity and detail, which we can do. We have plenty of viewers that are doing that already, um, just so we can see the distribution of uh, the uptake of programs and make sure that we're, we are um, upholding that sort of access for all um, uh, component of this. So. A little muddled, but I'm looking forward to some of the conversations we have coming up as I, and I see them connected to some of the points that we haven't touched on yet that are mentioned in the list. Great, thank you. Right, looking at equity across all of the different um, ways that we can cross cut, right? Our, our rural communities as well as low income, et cetera, et cetera. Um, great, so I'm mindful of the time, maybe not as mindful as I should be, but I, I just wanna touch on the guiding principles quickly because I know we're, we're gonna lose Jane um, right at one o'clock. Um, guiding principles document was sent around um, for review by the subcommittee. I'm not going to do that exercise where we all read it um, while we're sitting here. That one is pretty meaty, um, 12 pages. But again, this um, this made it to the agenda because um, both Rich and I, the co-chairs, were invited to meet with uh, members of the Just Transition subcommittee over the summer. Past couple months, we each were able to attend one of those sessions and again, just have a conversation around how these principles are being incorporated in the recommendations that are um, being developed um, in the subcommittees. So I just want to pass this on to the subcommittees um, and, and just as a reminder really um, to the task groups to be kind of um, using these principles. And, and I think really the most um, potentially the most useful piece or the most practically useful piece is the questions um, that we can use to evaluate any recommendations that together. So um, for anyone who did have a chance to review, re-review the guiding principles document, again, this isn't new. This was finalized um, during the last climate action plan. Um, I just want to take a couple minutes if anyone has any comments or anything that resonates with you specifically from this this document, especially as you approach the work um, for the, the 2025 update. Not seeing anything immediately. We can certainly revisit this in September. As I said, you know, equity is one of the um, lenses through which we'll generate our prioritization of the recommendations. So we'll be revisiting this this document and um, and using the tools to actually apply um, to the to the recommendations. And Sam, go ahead, please. I'm just gonna briefly say that I, I have found this, um, it, it is a meaty document and, and the rubric itself, uh, that, that sort of um, maybe sort of applicable piece that is, you know, um, you can fill out if you will, um, is also quite lengthy, but um, I have used this in the past for other things. And also I wonder if this group would consider, and this is a conversation we can have maybe later, a later point is, you know, um, streamlining some of the questions, but considering not only passing our, our um, pathways, strategies, and actions through this, but also the chapter itself in draft form. Um, and, and maybe that it's also a tool uh, for when um, drafting a chapter or updating a chapter uh, comes, uh, comes when we come to that phase, if you will. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Bram. Uh, so yes, there is a lot of really good thinking and uh, clear communication in this document. Um, and, you know, for me, kind of the summary that I carry around in my head is one, that we should be ensuring that our plan is being co-created with, in partnership with the marginalized communities. And two, all of our actions to the extent possible, um, uh, a disproportionately a disproportionate amount of the benefits should flow to marginalized communities and a, uh, a, a disproportionately small share of the costs should be placed upon marginalized communities. Extra, yeah, increased benefits, reduced costs and co-creation. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that framing and I'm seeing some thumbs up. Um, you know, I think that I agree. That's kind of my takeaway from this document. And I think um, 
us to say, as we formulate these recommendations for policies, um, really to go a step further than to say, well, it depends on the program design ultimately, that we really embed in the recommendation ways to mitigate any potential negative impacts on marginalized or disadvantaged communities and really make that part of the package. Um, I think, you know, one of my frustrations reading the previous recommendations was sometimes it was left as a, well, it's a TBD. We'll see when, when it's time to formulate the policy, we'll see how to mitigate um, impacts. So I think that really um, your framing makes a lot of sense, right? We know there's an inequitable distribution of costs and benefits currently in the status quo. And how do we actually correct for that um, as we make our recommendations? Any other comments? Document. All right, we are going to move on. And 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 Bram, to your other point um, about making these recommendations in cooperation or partnership, uh, co-created, I think is your word. I love that. Um, so I think um, we'll we'll talk more about this in September. But um, my understanding is with the public outreach and engagement strategy, um, once we come up with our kind of draft set of recommendations in September, we will forward um, with some focus groups specific to each subcommittee to really engage with um, with affected stakeholders and communities and the public in general um, over the fall. And maybe Jane can touch a little bit on that when she gives her update. But um, I think the Climate Action Office is up next um, for updates. So we're going to dive right in. And we. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I feel like it's been forever since I've been in one of these meetings. So nice to see everybody. Um, I think the main justification for having um, me join today was to give an update on the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant and what's next as a result of Vermont not receiving funding. Um, so I'm going to give an overview of that. I'm also happy to touch on any of the things you just alluded to, Melissa, and then I'm also interested to stay for the conversation that Brian will lead on our intentions on how to support the modeling needs, especially related to this subcommittee's work as we advance recommendations and a plan um, to meet the 2030 emissions reductions. So thank you. Um, so let's, I'll start with the bad news, <laughs> um, I guess. Um, I'm sure most people have heard the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant Implementation Grant for the state was not funded. Um, I will sort of not sugarcoat how surprised we were by the approach EPA took in that space. Um, it was um, a very um, detailed notice of funding opportunity, NOFO, that was released for those funds. And to be frank, um, I don't feel like EPA followed the rules and expectations that they set around the funding. Um, and as a result, maybe the strategies and choices that we made as a state would have been different if we had understood how they were gonna actually advance funding um, in that space. But every indication of every um, uh, technical assistance um, meeting we went to, conversation we had with EPA, was that their intent was to give some sort of funding to every jurisdiction, um, not every applicant, but every state jurisdiction, I should say. And because Vermont had no cities or jurisdictions that were large enough to apply on their own, that meant that we put all of our eggs into our state application and as a result strategically chose not to sign on to collaborative applications because we really felt like we put our best foot forward on programs and projects that could really advance emissions reductions in our state application. And I won't, it was a very heavy lift, the plan, uh, the Priority Climate Action Plan. It was an all sort of hands on deck state government approach for that plan. It was really programs and um, projects that agencies were rallied around that if they only had more funding to do could advance in a timely manner. And so we didn't want to sign on to collaborative grants um, because we were afraid that they would say, well, Vermont's getting a very small piece of a larger pie and we don't need to fund their state application as a result. But now we're in the sort of, uh, sort of bad shape of not being on any um, receiving end of federal funds. We have a debrief meeting with EPA on August 20th. Uh, our secretary and business director are participating too um, to really understand what's next from EPA's perspective. From a policy perspective, um, I think you all know that we're a member of the U.S. Climate Alliance, which is the governor's coalition of 24 states. In that space, we understand and expect that that coalition is advocating on two fronts. 
Um, one, to have the program reauthorized. Um, CPRG received $35 billion of requests for $4.6 billion in funds. So states and cities around the country were like demonstrated a need for the funding and an interest in putting it on the ground. And so obviously the federal election will sort of tell if and when there's that possibility, but they're already starting to sort of meet and lobby on behalf of state governors to pursue reauthorization. And the second option also is that um, there's a huge philanthropic interest to fund state plans um, and municipal actions, um, knowing that these are projects that are ready to go to meet the mission reduction goals. And so um, we were transparent in releasing our implementation grant to the Climate Alliance to work with philanthropic gift, uh, gifts and alignment with donors to see if there's a way to bring uh, revenue to the state for programs. Those are the two big federal fronts. On sort of a smaller um, interested front, we as a Climate Action Office are, um, and in partnership with other state agencies, trying to not let the ball drop on some of the most important measures in that um, our application and um, are looking to redirect some of our state uh, resources to measures in the um, implementation grant and working collaboratively with uh, the governor and other departments, as I mentioned, like public service department on energy navigators and other programs that um, might um, uh, actually fall apart if not if not to receive funding in the near term um, and then have to be stood up again, which is just a loss of time and capacity around a measure that's so important. Um, and then also working collaboratively with other state agencies here to make sure that things that were going to be funded like EV and state EV incentives that weren't in the budget this year are front and center for the Budget Adjustment Act um, and our agency is advocating in concert with other agencies like VTRANS to make sure that is still funded. So we're using it as a plan to proactively address uh, what the administration's priorities were for emissions reductions and trying to find ways to still fund it. And the final thing I'll just note is you probably did see that in the Northeast two, no other Northeastern state, this is what's frustrating, I think in the front and center is that no state got state funding in the Northeast. <laughs> um, they didn't fund a single state application. Um, they funded two, and many states in the Northeast had really strong applications, I would argue. Their decisions were to put the funding in, you know, states that were purple and states that were red, which arguably um, also would have an impact where funding might not have gone anyway. So understand that, but then they also sort of gave Colorado two applications. They gave the city of Denver 200 million, and then they gave the state 200 million. So, um, don't really understand some rationale around how they made selections. And they also said that they would give largest number of applications to small grants and decrease as they went up the food chain to bigger applications. And that's not at all what they did. They only gave one small grant out and funded mostly large collaborative grants. So we'll ask all these questions and we'll continue to pursue um, the measures that were in that plan and to find funding where possible. And then are also, the final point that I was going to make was um, working with our neighbor states to figure out if even after the fact Vermont can um, sort of come late to the party for some of the co collaborative grants. Um, EPA specifically directed Connecticut, for instance, to reach out to Vermont on the heat pump collaboration grant um, because we're the only state in the Northeast that didn't sign on for good reason, I'll say, because the whole grant application is actually modeled after successful programs already being deployed in Vermont, um, where other states in the Northeast don't have the same kind of incentives as us. But that is not to say that we wouldn't benefit from more resources going to those programs, as well as some of the innovation and technical assistance centers envisioned to support supply chain um, issues. So um, we are meeting with other states to think about what Vermont's role can be there and if there's actually funding that can be redirected to us. So not all hope is lost. We might still get some money. <laughs> um, maybe I'll pause there and just see if there's any questions about CPRG um, and then we'll from there. Graham, go ahead. Uh, not a question, just uh, an expression of gratitude to you guys for all the work you did putting the application together. And, um, you know, sorry about the, 
surprising and very disappointing result. And then back to thanks for the fact that you didn't let that stop you. And you guys are working on lots of very resourceful ways to try to replace the money and, and find paths forward. So um, thanks. And I'm sorry. And thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Bear. Um, Jade has Jade, um, there been any reactions from our congressional representatives and any offers of help from them? Yeah, um, um, I, Julie, uh, Secretary Moore, reached out to the congressional delegation immediately after we heard, shared the news, um, and um, while they our congressional delegation asked, actually asked if they could meet in the debrief meeting with EPA with us, um, and while it was deemed not appropriate at that scale, we uh, were committed to following up with them immediately after about how EPA uh, portrays their decision to us um, to talk with them about certain next steps because um, clearly they would be advocates for reauthorization of a program like this. So important to sort of explain to them uh, the challenges we saw in this process and sort of what the expectations should be going forward. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks, Melissa, for the time to talk about it. Um, I guess I'll just say real quickly to the point that um, on a different topic, but to the point that you were alluding to about um, the guiding principles and outreach and engagement, I just want to um, thank the co-chairs, Rich and Melissa, for taking the time to meet with um, Liz, um, our new climate planning administrator, and myself recently about sort of needs and actions um, and a guidance still further needed for subcommittees at this time. And um, we have been doing that across the board with all subcommittee co-chairs um, and then starting to meet um, in partnership with CBI to sort of plan um, how we sort of continue to move the needle on advancing the updates to the Climate Action Plan. And some of the work that's still coming um, is um, sort of a, a re- um, clarity, clarifying sort of position from the Just Transition Subcommittee on their role. And one of the things that they've been talking about is still further training on um, to subcommittees and others about how to put the guiding principles into practice. Um, and so that's sort of to, to still to be determined, but they're really thinking about their role as a support subcommittee to really implement those principles and what that looks like, um, knowing how um, we want to do that throughout operationalize that work, not wait till the end to review action. So it's really about systems thinking from the beginning. So they'll still be thinking about that. And um, we met earlier this morning, actually, Sophie and Liz and I to really talk about the arc of engagement and to re um, sort of talk about a work plan for the stakeholder meetings that um, we'll be helping to support for the subcommittees this fall and really addressing a timeline that's more like October for those meetings, knowing that um, it's feeling like September is still needed to, for uh, maybe not as much even for cross sector, but especially for some of the other subcommittees who are vetting a lot of action to really coalesce around what it, it's going to look like as a suite of recommendations to then vet with stakeholders. But that will be something, a guidance around like what's needed from subcommittees to identify the stakeholders and what the climate office will do for all of you to support those meetings uh, coming in a few weeks. So stay tuned. And um, yeah, the co-chairs are invited to the next steering committee meeting, which is not this coming Monday, but the week after um, to really further cement templates and the guidance to sort of get the subcommittees through December which is really the bulk of the subcommittee work. And then it transitions up to the council to deliberate and put together a draft plan for March is the goal. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, um, sounds like the fall is going to be busy. And just while we have you, um, I wanna move over to Brian and the modeling, but did you wanna say just a couple minutes about the piece with rural resilience and the roles of those two subcommittees? Yeah, so at the steering committee meeting, um, not this coming Monday, but the following Monday, we are going to have a proposal for um, uh, for all of for the steering committee to consider on how we deal with cross cutting issues. Um, and so that's sort of a stay tuned for the steering committee to really um, weigh in on and consider how we deal with issues around that sort of 
cut across and inform all the actions and recommendations in the in the plan. But you may recall that, um, or Jared will recall, because we've already picked on Jared that he knows the GWSA inside out. So uh, Jared will recall that in the GWSA, there's this specific obligation to rural resilience to develop um, recommendations specific around cutting emissions in municipalities. And it, it's more detailed than that around fossil fuel reductions in municipal buildings, schools, um, and different things. And that's always felt like sort of an awkward fit in rural resilience. Last time, I think they really took the actions and recommendations from cross sector and then tried to scale them to municipal action. This time we're thinking about sort of, and Andrea um, has really said, it feels like that should live with cross sector. However, we'll need some input from rural resilience. So um, at the steering committee meeting on that Monday, we'll also talk about sort of a concerted approach um, through one or two meetings of cross sector led, but with rural resilience participation, um, thinking about what those actions look like across the sectors um, for municipal level actions. So just sort of recognizing that it's written into law for rural resilience to deal with it, but it continues to feel like an awkward fit. And the recommendation from them is for them to support you all in doing and scaling some of your recommendations to address municipal action. That, and that's the level of detail I have at this point, but hopefully it'll be more resolved in the near term. Yeah, we'll stay tuned. Thanks for that update as well. My immediate reaction was this some committee has enough on its plate. Please don't give us anything more. But um, sounds like there'll be a, a path forward with um, working jointly with rural resilience. Um, so I think we're just a couple minutes behind on the agenda. We, uh, next item up was for Brian to give an update on the pathways modeling uh, that will be used to support um, the update to the climate action plan. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And uh... I'll try and keep it brief to catch us back up. As you know, the original climate action plan um, was supported by um, the study from um, Energy Futures Group, the uh, Vermont Pathways 2.0, and uh, they developed the Vermont Pathways model in the low emissions analysis platform. Um, that was the platform that uh, PSD had also selected to do the comprehensive energy plan. It's all picked because um, Previous iterations of the Comprehensive Energy Plan had engaged consultants that were using proprietary models uh, that the um, state agencies, the um, PSD in particular, weren't able to really work with, and you know couldn't make modifications after the fact after the con um, after the contracts had expired, um, and they were looking for a, a different kind of tool um, that was more that transparent and that would be easier for staff to. Um, to work with even as the, and develop some competence and um, even after that contract expired. So that's the low emissions analysis platform um, that's published by um, and supported by the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, they also worked with uh, EFG as a subcontractor for the buildings and thermal analysis. Many of you know that. Um, we are in a conversation um, in the process now of um, contracting directly with SEI for support of Vermont Pathways uh, for the next four years. Um, in particular, um, we are going to be um, asking them to provide user support for um, the users both in ANR, in the Climate Action Office, and in PSD you know, for accomplishing you know, uh, tasks in the existing model, kind of lower um, lower level of effort tasks, just kind of a, a basic support function, some updating. There's a new version of LEAP that's available. Um, so potentially updating some of the um, existing scenarios, um, versions of remote pathways so that they'll run in the new version. Um, there's some new features that are available. Um, so we're going to be asking them to do that. Um, we're going to be asking them to update the Baseline scenario, that's the scenario that we look at. That's uh, the <clears throat> best representation in the model based upon the existing data and forecasts um, to be able to compare that to you know, mitigation scenarios. Um, that's the approach that we use both with the Vermont Pathways 2.0 and with the buildings and thermal analysis. So we'll be going through that exercise with them. There'll be some capacity in the contract to run um, scenarios in support of the climate action plan, some limited number of scenarios. I 
um, don't have a number quite yet. Um, but the idea is that, you know, it, in the past, in the Pathways 2.0 report, there was the baseline scenario, and then there was a cap mitigation scenario that was presented in the report. Um, so um, that scenario could be updated. Um, there are options on that scenario, different ways that you can achieve the required emissions reductions on particular times. So um, we'll have some capacity to be able to look at some options for paths forward to be able to um, achieve the emissions reductions 2030 and, and 2050. And then um, there'll be some capacity for some you know, other work as needed regarding uh, pathways. And we'll do that on a work order basis. So we'll be able to scope out particular um, discrete tasks with their own budgets internal to the contract. Um, it's not in place yet. Um, it's a little complicated because um, not only is it a state contract, but because it's for IT services and software it requires some additional approvals to go through, but it is making its way through the process. Um, it, um, associated with that, but on a separate track is we are also um, acquiring another, um, that we're updating our licenses for LEAP for the next four years. So that will be current with our licensing as well. Um, both of those are proceeding. I am optimistic that um, at least on the licensing side, we'll um, have that done before the end of this month. Um, and that we'll have, we'll be making good progress if, if, if not almost ready to sign a contract by the end of this month for the support function. Thanks, Brian. Looks like maybe a couple of questions on the modeling. Um, Jared, go ahead. Thanks, Melissa. Um, one of the first questions that, that comes to mind um, after hearing that, Brian, and thanks for the update, is about the, the process for input and review in terms of updating the BAU and the pathways scenarios. Um, I think all of us know that, you know, that's not just a kind of a straightforward data or mathematical question that um, there's you know, questions of emphasis and, and priority. There's also questions of uh, feasibility and the correct assumptions. And so I just want to make sure that any process uh, to update the, the business as usual uh, scenario or to up, update pathways in support of the climate action plan, given how foundational and central it is to the cap and how closely tied the pathways targets are to the recommendations around strategies and actions in the climate action plan I want to make sure that we are setting up um, really clear lines of communications and expectations around uh, what those inputs and assumptions are and uh, kind of a robust review and feedback process so that it's you know not just something that kind of happens behind the scenes by SEI, and then and then we see the result at the end without the ability to um, comment on the appropriate inputs, assumptions, target numbers, um, et cetera. So um, if you, you know, I, ha I have some initial thoughts on um, ways that I think that that could be helpfully done. I think it would be really great to have um, some members of this subcommittee and, and the science and data subcommittee, perhaps there would be others. But I, but I do think it's really important that there be a review, at least a review task group, and uh, to be able to carefully review that and then periodic updates and opportunities for feedback from, from this committee uh, and the science and data subcommittee. Oh, yeah, that, um, like I said, we're fo the focus right now has been on just the administrative part of getting SEI on board. Um, but yeah, if you've got a uh, proposal and uh, if there's interest and capacity amongst uh, folks to participate in a group like that, um, we'd be happy to hear it. Great. Thanks, Brian and Jared. Adam, did you have a comment? Yeah, just a uh, clarifying question, Brian. You, you kept you mentioned baseline scenario, and I just wanted to check, are you using that synonymously with business as usual trajectory? Because Jared was just talking about BAU and you're talking about a baseline. I just want to make sure that for everyone's edification that they're one and the same. Yeah, people people use them 
interchangeably. Um, I like to use baseline only because um, I don't want to suggest that this model is a crystal ball and it says this is what will happen if we do, you know, if we're doing or on this, we don't make any changes. Um, the this model and, and really, you know, any model of economy and emissions and things like that is, you know, you're really saying we get, we're setting up a, some, a reference case. This is the way we talk about it in Reggie. And then we say, if we do this or these things, then how is it different from the reference case? And, you know, it certainly can help you say, yeah, we're, you know, and the idea is to say, if we do these things, we are likely to achieve a particular outcome. But it doesn't say the baseline is the trajectory that we are on. And if we do X, Y, or Z, this is exactly where we'll end up. So a little bit of a semantic thing, but I, but yes, they're used interchangeably and I prefer to use baseline because I think it emphasizes the idea that this is, you know, something that you are comparing a alternate future state to in the model. Yeah, Jared, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just Sorry, just one additional piece that I think goes beyond updating the baseline and the pathways with with new information and new assumptions. I think there there's still an outstanding issue where the the leap model or the Vermont pathways model um, is coming up with estimates of Vermont's statewide emissions um, that are consistently and significantly undercounting our annual emissions relative to the emissions that are officially reported in the state's greenhouse gas inventory. So if you take the six years, 2015 to 2021, for which there's annual statewide estimates for both the inventory and the, the LEAP slash Vermont Pathways model, Every single year for which there's comparative data between between those two, the inventory and the and the leap model, there is an undercount of the emissions in the the Vermont Pathways leap model, and it's on average about five hundred and fifty thousand tons. And so, if the if the leap model in Vermont Pathways is going to be the basis for saying what what are baseline emissions and what do we need to do. It, by future years, there's also work that still needs to be done to recalibrate that model or to use data inputs that are consistent with the inventory so that those things are more closely aligned. Because right now we're in a, I think, untenable situation where we're relying on model outputs that have consistently and significantly diverged from the official accounting that's in the state inventory and that the, the Solutions Act solely points to as, as the measure of compliance. And if folks are interested, I'm happy to kind of walk through that in terms of you know what the Solutions Act says, can share that language, um, can also share you know, the specific data comparison. Um, you know, there's a table at the end of uh, page four of the document I just put in the chat. Um, but that is an upfront issue that I think needs to be addressed and resolved uh, for us to have um, uh, confidence in the outputs of that model for use in the next cap. Yeah, I don't wanna take up too much time because I know Christine's really anxious to give the buildings thermal update. <laughs> well, yeah, Brian, if you wanna, speak quickly and then and certainly more to come on this right Jared I mean this speaks to having input on the assumptions right if the correct I don't want to say correct assumptions best assumptions that we have can go into the model it, it improves the accuracy but Brian go ahead and take a minute if you want to respond uh, yeah so I mean certainly you know it's standard model practice to try and calibrate your model with you know previously known data but um you know we've heard some comment about making the inputs for the LEAP model for the forecast, the same as the ones for the inventory. And that simply isn't possible because the inventory is based upon actual reported data that Colin gets from state sources, from the federal government. Um, you know, those, um, those numbers aren't 
exact numbers, but they are the reported numbers. It's a methodology that he uses. And what LEAP attempts to do, what any model attempts to do, is to use, you know, we use forecasts. The, the LEAP model was using forecasts from others, from Velco, from um, Efficiency Vermont, um, a number of other sources from the federal government on, you know, what fuel prices were going to be, what penetration of EVs were going to be. And that, you know, those forecasts are not the same data as the data that we use for the inventory because they simply can't be. Um, so I've said this before, Jared, you know, we are going to make an effort to make it, um, you know, to improve the methodology, to align it better with the historical emissions. We probably are not going to go back to 2015 to do that um, because it's not, that's not really a value added exercise. Um, so it definitely can be better, but they, you know, except for just entering the data that we have, which is uh, something that you can do in LEAP for the inventory emissions for the years that we have it, and they would match exactly. Um, that's not going to either, you know, improve or um, put into question what the what the forecasts are going to be, because it would be, a, you know, a, a completely different methodology. And it's true that they, you know, there, as you go back through the early years of the model and the results that we have, that there's been a discrepancy over time, as you get closer to the like 2020 and 2021, that discrepancy decreases. And it's actually hasn't really been very large in the two sectors that are really driving our emissions in transportation and in um, the residential and commercial industrial sector, as you get you know into the 2019, 2020 period as well. So um, we have really great confidence with SEI. We have a good relationship with them. Um, we're, like I said, working through the contracting period. We're thinking about ways to be able to get you know, like the, the best, most relevant forecasts and to be able to develop methodologies to be able to project changes in the Vermont economy regarding emissions generation activities to be able to make them all as useful as possible. Um, but it will, it will never be the crystal ball that I talked about. It's going to be, here's what, what the direction that we're on. And if we are take this mitigation pathway or that mitigation pathway, here are the results that we can expect in direction and magnitude. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Jared, maybe really quickly, like yeah. I don't want to spend more than one more minute on this topic. Yeah, totally hear that. Um, I would just say, that um, I think there's two issues here. I agree with Brian in terms of the difficulty of forecasting future numbers, but in terms of what we're building on, a, a check on the accuracy and appropriateness of the LEAP model is in the past, the data that exists, does it align with uh, what the inventory is reporting or not? And I just don't think that we can have confidence about future forecasts until and unless uh, though the, the estimates that are emerging are aligned. And consistently we're seeing, again, an undercounting on the pathways model of over 500,000 tons. Um, and th the most recent one was even more. In the 2020, and for 2021, the comparison between LEAP and Vermont pathways versus the inventory was a 600,000 ton difference. So agreed that future forecasts are problematic or difficult, but let's at least make sure that the data inputs and the methods and the assumptions are reflecting the actual reported, uh, uh, officially reported numbers in the inventory as closely as possible. If not, then it's just not the right baseline. Yeah, so I think we're going to leave it there. Brian, thanks so much for the update and Jared for raising this issue of the discrepancy. And it sounds like we have a path forward with a potential task group uh, by subcommittee task group um, to help, to continue the conversation um, through the fall on the assumptions uh, that will be moved. So um, so I know that the Building the Thermal Task Group has been hard at work, and we're going to hear, I think, from Christine and Dave and Sam on um, what they've been up to. And uh, I'd love to stick to 1.30, as closely to 1.30 as we can for public comment, because we might have some members of the public here. Um, but let's go through the presentation. And if we have to pause partway through our subcommittee discussion to hear from the public, um, I think that'll be helpful and beneficial. So Brian, I think you're going to do a screen share of some slides. While we're segueing, I, I appreciate Brian's nod to not using up 
thermal time, but I must say, the more I hear this modeling discussion as a non-modeler, the more I agree how important it is to do our best moving forward to create alignment. Um, and I don't know enough, of, and thankfully I'm glad I don't, because all of many of you do, don't know enough about how the modeling works, but just from the outside looking in, it makes a lot of sense to me to make sure we've uncovered every possibility for increasing alignment, since we have the benefit of having inventory real world data. But while we're waiting, um, thank you, Brian, for sharing your screen. And um, welcome to the building's thermal task group update on what the task group's been working on in preparation for providing cross-sector um, some well-considered pathway strategies and actions um, as the subcommittee considers what to move forward to the council later in the process. Um, we are focused so much as we all know on this sector because the thermal sector produces about 36% of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions. And that's because of the use of fossil fuels for space and water heating, cooking, process heat and industrial processes and other thermal uses. This sector is especially important as we know, um, as we consider our commitment to equity and increase our understanding of the large energy burden on the lowest income households in Vermont who pay the highest portion of their income on energy. So hence, the thermal sector is front and center in our work moving forward. Next slide, please, Brian. We have a great team of eight members serving on the thermal task group. Half of the task group were not, to my knowledge, directly involved in developing thermal sector recommendations for the 2021 cap for consideration by the subcommittee and then for forwarding to the council for their consideration. So um, we have a great um, set of new expertise, ideas, and voices at the table. Of course, it's always by Zoom, but the electronic table and um, a great combination of policy, legislative, regulatory, and on the ground, real world weatherization and solar installation experience in the case of Ben, for example. So it's um, uh, just been a delight to dive in with this team of people. Next slide, please. We um, centered ourselves in our forming mode. We're in, I think, virtually moved through our forming mode, through our norming mode and now into our storming mode as a task group, but we centered ourselves in the forming stages just six meetings ago to reminding ourselves of the pathway strategies and actions framework approach that evolved in the last process leading up to the initial 2021 cap as being the sort of uh, structural framing of the cap and reminded ourselves of the difference between pathway strategies and actions. And as part of recentering ourselves in that work and or coming into that framework for the first time, for those who didn't happen to be involved in cap planning last time, we found as we've looked back at what was actually recommended for the thermal sector last time, and as we've been working on our own work this time, that in addition to pathways that are intended to achieve high level means of greenhouse gas emission reductions. Not only can that mean pathways that lead to certain equipment or widgets or measures, as I think of it, that actually reduce greenhouse gas when they're used. It also can mean pathways that include or deal with complementary regulatory, legislative, or policy approaches that create the market conditions that are needed for the widgets, for the equipment, for the actual devices to be to be used. So it's 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 both uh, making sure you have the technical means to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, and making sure you have the market context 
as a result of various policy, legislative, and or regulatory actions that will ensure the uptake of those measures and widgets. Um, so that's been, that will show up in our work as we talk further about the pathways or strategies we're suggesting for the subcommittee's consideration. Next slide, please. So we have divided up when we think about how to, how does the thermal sector produce greenhouse gas emissions? And so therefore, where do we look for reduction opportunities? We think about both the buildings and the equipment used in the buildings, and then the fuel used in the equipment that are used in the buildings. And there are opportunities for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in all three areas, all three of those areas of focus. In addition, not, not, not unique to the thermal sector, but there are, we have had found last time and are finding again this time, there are often cross-cutting issues that are broader and, and, and relevant, not only to the thermal sector, but to other sectors, but we're calling them out in our work to help make sure they get lifted up in the right way as the process unfolds moving forward. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam first, and then Dave, who are gonna talk you through the pathways and strategies we've de developed so far for buildings, equipment, and fuels, and then some cro and some cross-cutting issues we've identified, and then I'll do a brief wrap up and invite your feedback after their remarks. So I'll next slide, please, and we'll kick it over to Sam. Thanks, Al. <clears throat> Again, I'm Sam Lash. She hers. I'm the climate and energy planner at Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and here on the cross sector as the um, just transitions liaison. Um, and in the interest of time, I thought I'd give some, some brief overviews of the things that have sort of uh, shifted from the previous strategies um, over things were added or, um, and why, and then also just a, a few key considerations. Um, I, I realized when I was uh, sort of putting key points together, I had like six pages and I was like, oh, wow, this is, there's, there's so many things that we've discussed and have come up. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to, to go fast and keep to time. Um, so just in terms of buildings, the overall pathway you can see here at the top. I wasn't going to read it, but then I realized for folks that are may, maybe watching the video, it might be useful to do so. Um, so the pathway is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with buildings and facilities through cost effective and affordable weatherization and energy efficiency improvements, as well as through use and enforcement of building energy codes. So I highlighted a few things, the original path uh, that were uh, different in, uh, from the original pathway, and that includes um, the language reduce greenhouse gas emissions to, to uh, keep the uh, scope of the um, plan really uh, for, forefront in that higher level pathway. Um, and then we also did remove the by at least 25% uh, understanding that the strategies could be more specific um, with uh, sort of the, the metrics um, uh, and, and also further specificity could be found in the actions which are, are not detailed uh, here, which we're still working on. Um, uh, I think very broadly overall, um, the first two strategies are more focused on uh, retrofitting, you could say, um, and the third on, on new construction. So keeping that uh, difference in, in mind or sort of that division in mind. Um, overall key considerations and the conversations that went into this pathway and also um, into the strategies themselves and, and, and beginning to talk about all the specific actions. Uh, uh, one is obviously that um, electric, uh, I mean, sorry, that efficiency is important not only for the conservation of, of energy here, uh, definitely focus on, on electricity, um, but also, uh, and not only as an emissions reduction strategy, but really has significant um, health and financial benefits at the individual scale, the community scale, for businesses and, and also at the state. So just a few, throw out a few of the many, I mean, pages of, of sort of things that we found in different reports and from talking to different stakeholder groups um, that are doing this on the ground, you know, uh, recently Efficiency Vermont put the economic value of efficiency writ large, you know, about 15% of, of Vermont's uh, 2021 electrical needs were met by efficiency that was delivered at 75% of the cost of purchasing new power. So at a really broad scale, thinking in that really sort of economic lens, it, that's incredibly important. And then, you know, switching gears to think about uh, everyday Vermonters, um, you know, across the state, um, you know, energy burden has been linked in several recent studies to um, increase in energy burden with increases in asthma, heart disease, malnutrition, and, and, and exacerbating issues with those and other, uh, and other uh, um, issues, including um, uh, psychological well-being due to adverse decision-making about heating and cooling in the face of other priorities like shelter and food. So um, really this runs 
the, the scale of, of, there's a massive scale here of things to consider and numbers um, uh, and sort of reports and, and considerations that have gone into this. Um, in general, looking really at that first strategy to ramp up implementation of the multi-year weatherization at scale initiative, which was in the first, uh, uh, which was the first strategy in the previous plan, um, including language here to meet the scale and pace of residential and commercial weatherization. So really outlining um, the different uh, sectors, if you will, in terms of residential, commercial, where this could be happening. Um, uh, that is identified, and we have an italics here uh, in the Vermont Pathways model as necessary to meet our 2030 uh, GWSA requirements. So adding the specificity in terms of, of a potential metric at the strategy level here, you'll see that also in strategy two, um, and keeping it italicized aware of all the work that Brian and Jared just discussed and wanting to make sure that as we go through this process, we, we figure out the best way to, to um, uh, provide sort of a specific uh, metric, but also uh, the best one and don't tie ourselves to something that um, is, is actively being worked on. Um, you know, weatherization is a key precursor to fuel switching, which you'll see uh, later on. Um, I think <clears throat> we talked a lot here um, both here and in the next strategy about um, uh, low and moderate income needs, about mismatched funding in terms of demand and eligibility, about funding clocks and, and stop gaps, um, sharp drop offs, including as near as 2026, um, and also key issues like weatherization ready, uh, so that there's a lot of work that often needs to go into homes um, uh, before they can be weatherized. And sometimes that's three or four times the amount that will be spent on the weatherization itself. So understanding sort of the complexity of, of these on the ground uh, and then how do we address those at a, at a much higher level are some of the uh, uh, conversations we've been having here. Um, I wanted to highlight throughout this that uh, we did discuss also um, housing needs. So the intersection, um, not only in terms of uh, income, but also uh, with rural communities, uh, with rural, with affordable housing uh, developers and, and nonprofits, with renters specifically, um, and then also those in mobile and manufactured homes. And so there's a lot to consider um, as we continue on with actions here. Um, but I hopefully maybe I can have a not nod. Can I have like one, one or two more minutes, or shall I? All right, I'm just going to proceed um, <laughs> really quickly. Um, so <clears throat> just to highlight again, uh, or throughout in strategy two about, oops, sorry, uh, ramping up the provision of technical support, funding, and financing to low and moderate income households. We really see the emphasis here to ensure an equitable transition to the use of non-greenhouse gas emitting fuels and weatherizing and energy efficient homes at the same language before at the scale and pace necessary to meet 2030 GWSA requirements. Again, uh, leaving it hopefully um, uh, uh, to later on in this process to, to add the specificity um, right there. I think we've had some enlightening conversations again here around um, the challenges that uh, Vermont programs are facing, especially in terms of the mosaic of funds. Um, you know, for example, uh, we saw some of our community action agencies with 80% of their funding targeting 40% of their clients, for example, on the ground. And again, this is my my summary um, at uh, being a little bit uh, smaller scale than, than some of the members here. So uh, I'll open it up in a second for others to, to join. But um, the last thing I wanted to highlight was really uh, strategy three, strengthening statewide building energy codes and fund code enforcement needed to meet the 2030 GWSA requirements. Again, really uh, um, uh, focusing there on, on, on GWSA and, and the goal of the plan. Um, this is really uh, gearing, uh, making sure there's a strategy specifically around new construction. Um, you know, I, th I think we had we had this um, old strategy, improve the energy performance of all new buildings in Vermont, which was, you know, a little bit um, more vague. And, and this this one hopefully will be a little bit uh, a little bit more specific. We saw in the Act 47 Building Energy Code Study Committee report uh, last year that compli compliance with energy codes uh, codes has been declining, um, uh, less so in the commercial building energy standards, more so in, in the residential um, building energy standards. Um, I know we have several experts on the call, um, but just want to flag uh, some of those reports for folks that may be interested in following up on some of these comments. Um, and while some of our analyses, including um, uh, from the uh, Public Service Department, among others, do um, assume a sort of a, a, a new compliance um, to be much higher um we are we are seeing things as low as uh, 54 percent in newly constructed uh, uh residential buildings so uh, trying to understand uh the the gaps and making sure that we address them that would that really comes down to enforcement um 
Uh, and and I, I know that this will be a lengthy conversation and the one that I hope that we'll have a robust um, community stakeholder engagement on perhaps. Um, uh, and this will be a key issue, but um, making sure that as we address our housing cri crises and as we address our aging housing stock, stock and as we address um, the fact that, uh, you know, as a state, we are um, uh, sort of demographically shifted towards uh, older residents, making sure that we are uh, comfortable, safe, um, and uh, uh and uh, efficient while reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions is really where these um, the, these codes can come in handy. So a, a good discussion there. A um, little bit rambly, but I'll stop there and happy to answer with more specifics. Great, thanks, Sam. That's, that's great background. I really appreciate that. Um, hi, folks. I'm Dave Farnsworth. I'm with the Regulatory Assistance Project. Um, you will see uh, some asterisks there. Um, Christine brought these up earlier. I just want to emphasize that um, that when you see asterisks, this denotes that the pathway or the strategy is a work in progress. And for the public, I think it's really important to understand that even things that we're finalizing on slides here, this work group really isn't where all the work gets done. None of this stuff is cut in stone. It gets bounced back up to the larger cross-sector mitigation committee, and they're the ones who decide what gets um, uh, adopted and recommended. So I just want to, uh, to emphasize that. So I'm going to be talking about equipment used in buildings and uh, fuels used in buildings. So here you have the, uh, the first pathway top here. It focuses on improving the performance of thermal equipment in buildings. And um, the two strategies of the two strategies, the first one leans towards developing an appliance standard. Appliance standards are typically adopted by a number of states to help change the way the market works. And what we wanna do is see high performing end use appliances come into this state and that'll involve eventually some coordination with other states, I would imagine. The second strategy there, it has an asterisk next to it, but it's important to um, address the need to lower the use of global warming potential refrigerants in um, in this equipment. And uh, that's a discussion that, that we are continuing to having right now. The next pathway that you see um, has to do with reducing costs for Vermont and for Vermont consumers related to new electrical equipment. Um, it's great that we're electrifying things. What we understand um, from analysis that's coming from across the globe is that electrification provides a really great pathway. Um, if we don't control that electrification, it's gonna cost more than it needs to. We may need to use twice the electricity uh, to reach our goals, but we don't wanna pay for five times the electricity. So here the pathway is to focus on reducing costs for Vermonters and consumers. Um, strategy one has to do with um, developing appliance standards for new uh, water heaters. And um, what those standards would do would, uh, would make them uh, appropriate for demand response programs where customers could have the utility uh, control water heaters just like uh, EV owners have the utility control or price electricity to manage that charging. So it's done in the least cost manner. So you have those two strategies and the second one it focuses on encouraging efficient integration of water heating load um, uh, to do to, to reach that uh, end. Uh, next slide, please, Brian. This pathway, quite simply, uh, the goal here is to reduce greenhouse gas intensity of fuels that we use uh, for thermal purposes in residential context, commercial, industrial. Um, context. And uh, the, the main strategy here is to implement the clean heat standard. That's a process that's underway. Folks know about that. Uh, there's a lot of detail that goes into explaining where that stands right at the moment. But this group is also discussing um, and discussions underway here that we're looking at the potential uh, for an alternative future where maybe the clean heat standard does not get approved by the legislature. It's supposed to go from the Public Service Board back to the legislature at the first of the year. Uh, what happens with um, reducing greenhouse gas intensity of fuels we use in our buildings if there's no clean heat standard? So we're having that discussion uh, as well. Um, the second 
strategy, uh, what's called cross-cutting, sorry. Um, cross-cutting is um, a strategy, uh, is a pathway rather that looks at uh, the need to um, focus on workers to recruit, train and retain them. Obviously it's really important to coordinate all the different players that are involved there. And that strategy is uh, a recognition that we need to do a lot of coordination because there are players employers out there, state programs, federal money, et cetera, that can help uh, in improving um, uh, the workforce situation that we have to meet all these Global Warming Solutions Acts, uh, Act needs. Um, is there another slide? One more slide for me. Um, this pathway concerns our interest in seeing greenhouse gas reduction requirements reflected in regulatory contexts. I didn't say that perfectly because they are already in many ways reflected in regulatory contexts, but we'd like to have that discussion. Um, and the strategy there is to make sure that greenhouse gas reduction and energy burden um, is uh, reflected in regulatory utility performance and metrics in the ways that performance is measured. Um, so we can stop, take a drink of water here. I'm gonna pass this back to Christine. Great, thank you, Sam and Dave. That was a whirlwind um, effective walkthrough of, um, of our work set thus far. If we can go to the next slide, please, Brian. Um, and just to reassure you, there are many other topics that were continuing to talk about and decide where best to suggest addressing them, whether at the pathway strategy or action level. Um, uh, but we understood our objective today was to focus the cross-sector subcommittee on proposed pathways and strategies, at least as far as we've gotten through in our work. So um, this is just recognizing that there, there are additional topics we'll, we will be continuing to think about. Um, we welcome your feedback today. I know we just have a few more minutes, but, and most of the pathways we shared with you at the last cross-sector meeting and invited your feedback on. So there shouldn't be, I don't think, any surprises in those if I'm recalling correctly, but this will be the first time we've shared proposed strategies. And I'm not sure how um, Melissa and Rich, you wish for the subcommittee to step through this work um, today or after today, but so I'll turn it over to you for that, but we're, we're, we're all ears. Yeah, thanks so much, Christine and Dave and Sam. That was a really comprehensive overview. Um, thanks for the information and for um, staying so closely on schedule. I do wanna um, open it up for subcommittee comment and discussion. I guess we'll take, questions first and like i said i do want to land close to 1 30 for public comment and then we'll continue our subcommittee discussion um, before we move on to the electricity subgroup so anyone with kind of short comments or um questions for the buildings and thermal task group um not seeing any immediately. I appreciate the overview. I appreciate the call out of areas where um, there might be additional public engagement. I think Sam mentioned that a couple of times as well. Um, and I guess I'll ask one quick, quick question, uh, not hearing any. Um, I think you mentioned, I think the, the wording on one of the slides was technical support. I wondered if that is explicitly, you know, we've heard a lot in the public engagement about energy navigators um, and energy coaches. Is that kind of what we're talking about when we talk about technical support? And I just wonder if we should be really explicit about that. Um, that was being near and dear to my heart. That's one of the items that was included in the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant that um, Jane spoke about earlier that, of course, now is, is absent a funding source. So um just wanted to know one if that was what was meant there. I see some nodding and, and two, just you know, a pitch to keep that front and center as an unfunded piece. And I'll just add really quickly. Um, we've also talked about maximizing federal funds. And Sam, you mentioned um kind of the pre-weatherization and health and safety work that all is needed before we can do some of our mitigation activities. And I'll just, you know, working through federal funding right now, that's not not typically an allowable expense. So that's another one. Those two, the energy navigators and the pre-weatherization structural work are kind of like orphan expenses where we don't have a natural um, funding source. So, 
stop there. Any, um, yeah, Rich, go ahead. Thanks very much, guys. That's a really good overview and concisely presented. Um, I agree with some of the topics on the last slide about additional uh, it, topic areas that should be addressed. Um, and I, I appreciate the breadth of your review and the different recommendations. Um, you know, and I know that you understand the challenge of meeting the the sector's proportional responsibility of emission reductions through a portfolio of of measures and policies. And it will be really interesting to see how the numbers add up for these different policies. And you know, and I appreciate the your observation that, there are a variety of ways to get there, um, but we need to to be, you know, pretty disciplined about coming up with a portfolio of recommendations that that will achieve substantial reductions, and also, uh, while also keeping in mind our equity uh, obligations and uh, focus. So, so far, I just have to say thanks. Looks like a good suite of, of uh, recommendations. Great. So there, I'd love to pivot to just have a couple of minutes for opportunity for public comment. It looks like we have a couple um, folks on the line. So is there anyone who would like to participate in public comment or offer comment for the subcommittee's consideration? All right, not hearing any public comment at this time. Um, but yeah, I think we can spend a few more minutes if there's more subcommittee discussion on the buildings and thermal sector and the and the potential pathways that were just um, laid out by buildings and thermal. Yeah, Jared, please. Thanks, Melissa. One question I have is I know that Jane shared earlier that at the August 19th steering committee meeting, there's gonna be this discussion about addressing kind of cross-cutting recommendations between different subcommittees. But the, the presentation of the thermal uh, task group recommendations made me think about cross-cutting recommendations between the task groups of our subcommittee. And so thinking about you know some of those, especially those last two cross-cutting pathways, um, I think it's worth some thought uh, around when and how we collaborate with um, the electricity task group. Um, I think that's the the primary one, but there there may be others. And do we um, do we set up specific time for those task groups to meet together? Do we just do that in our full subcommittee meeting? But I I think it would be just in terms of consistency. I'm I'm having trouble thinking about it, when it comes to the actual plan itself do we pull out those cross-cutting ones and list them up front or in addition to the, the very sector-specific recommendations? Or if they're cross-cutting, do they get repeated in each set of sector recommendations? I think probably the, the former, but just like the mechanism for that, um, I don't know whether it's a once every task group has had the chance to develop initial recommendations around pathways and strategies, then then we identify what's cross-cutting and we have a subcommittee meeting that's a work session around those in particular. I don't know, I just think it's worth um, raising that issue and thinking ahead a little bit about how we might wanna deal with it. Yeah, absolutely, thanks for raising that. And that was one of the, the topics we, we hope to touch on in this um, discussion, um, specifically buildings and thermal and electricity. There is some overlap, I think, around these load management recommendations. Um, so one piece is how do we get that coordination and get all the voices kind of uh, singing from the same hymn book? Um, and then your second point about structurally, where do we reflect those? I think we can kind of make that decision down the road. I was just looking at the previous recommendations. I think there was specifically a cross set cross-cutting tab in the list of recommendations. Um, but, you know, load management, I think previously sat with the electricity sector, doesn't necessarily need to. Um, what do folks think about, you know, this could potentially be a joint meeting between those two subcommittees? I'm sorry, those two task groups, or as Jared said, it could just be a topic of a subcommittee discussion. Um, 
and we are going to be hearing from Peter soon on, on what the electricity task group is up to as well. Um, but just welcome thoughts about this coordination among our task groups. And Rich, go ahead. Well, at least on the the ones just discussed, the load management ones, I don't see that there's a, any, uh, I say, it, basic difference of opinion between the electricity task group and the buildings task group. And so there's there's no need to get together in order to iron out differences, is my guess. But getting together to agree on the best way to articulate or advance the the programs we want uh, makes a lot of sense. And I sus I'm a member of the electricity task group, and I suspect that our group would be very happy to sit with thermal and discuss the, the these cross cutting issues and um, figure out who will write it up and where later we can decide, as you said, Melissa, where it sits in the plan, but there's no need to say it twice in the plan. We could just say it once and, you know, put it in one category or the other, or as you say, you know, tab as cross, cross cutting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jared, go ahead. I was just thinking technically one consideration would probably be the combined membership of those task groups if it reaches above a quorum of the subcommittee then i think we would have to do it we should do it as a um subcommittee yeah. meeting um so maybe that actually helps um de determine i think the benefit of doing it as task groups is that it can be more nimble and like we, we can move more quickly and identify a time that works for a smaller group of people rather than um but, you know, if we have enough time to plan ahead, it's okay for it to be um, a main agenda item for a, a full subcommittee meeting. But just wanted to note that um, issue around uh, quorum being a, a factor. Yeah, no, definitely an important logistical consideration. I'm trying to do a quick count, but I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it on the fly. Um, so it could be a subset of both subcommittees or like both task groups, or like you said, a, a full subcommittee meeting. And, and I think we will talk at the end, um, start planning the seat about what kind of frequency we're going to see for full subcommittee meetings going through the fall and whether monthly is going to be adequate. Um, I'm, you know, just we're packing our agendas now. So that would be my only uh, hesitation there. So Sam, please go ahead. So to get in a slightly <clears throat> different direction, and also this may be tabled, I imagine, but um, just to flag um, and. I, I, I guess I'm curious and and so not totally clear on um, at what point. Um, I mean, obviously this slideshow and and this meeting is is ex publicly accessible, um, so these are out there. Um, but I'm wondering if as a as a um, subcommittee we have um, you know feelings or, or recommendations or or uh, requests of the community engagement folks around these measures specifically. When does it happen? Is it okay if it happens? you know, sooner rather than later. I think one of the loudest things that we heard and, and some of the feedback from the last plan was earlier conversations are better um, throughout the planning process. I, and I know it's a double-edged sword, more engagement takes can often take more time and can sometimes, um, sometimes the fact that it's a, a very early working draft can get lost and, you know, sometimes can create more tension. But I, I think usually that still results in a, and um, better communication and better engagement. Um, so I, I know it's a, a big ask, but I, I am curious if we have um, any specific questions we would ask the community engagement folks to to ask in their upcoming, um, whatever they have planned really. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up, Sam. Yeah, we do have an outstanding request from the Climate Action Office for any and all questions that we might want to go to Vermonters with uh, in the forums that they're already participating in. So they're doing farmers markets and other kinds of events. Um, so yeah, that's a great question for the subcommittee and the task group specifically. Are there specific questions? If not right at this moment, um, I think the tasks group, the task groups, I think specifically for buildings and thermal, and then I want to move on to electricity quickly. Um, I think you all are probably at that right stage now with these um, semi-baked uh, recommendations to be starting to frame up questions um for public engagement and so like i said that can be the ongoing outreach that the climate action office is doing with cbi 
Um, and then as Jane mentioned earlier, uh, in the October timeframe, there's gonna be that opportunity for focus groups. So really kind of frame out both what are questions we could ask um, kind of in a survey and what are questions that would lend themselves to de uh, more detailed discussion in a focus group. And again, the timing for that is it sounds like October. So coming out of September meetings, um, we should have some, some questions and feedback to give Climate Action Office. Yeah, Rich. I would I would just add to that that I do think these recommendations are probably framed well enough to discuss them with uh, the public generally. Ex except that it's really hard to ask people to form opinions about things when we're not also giving some input on how many what fraction of our carbon reduction goal would this accomplish and and how it, would it look, need to be paid for? Um, how much does it cost and, you know, and how would we think about paying for these actions? Uh, just asking people, do you like weatherization is, you know, it's useful, but um, I think it's, it, it's more respectful to people's uh, opinions and reactions if we also give them additional information about the scale of the problem, uh, the scale of the proposed solution, and something about what what are we paying now for energy and what how much would we save and how much would it cost to save it? I mean, those that kind of information is is uh, often not shared with the public and it makes it hard for people to have really well-informed opinions. Uh, so maybe the sessions that you were referring to, Melissa, on you know, stakeholder sessions where there's more information given would be a way to do that or um, deliberative polling techniques would be able to help with that. Um, I don't know. I think I'm, I may be making suggestions that just require more work than any of us, more work and more time than we have available, you know, but um, making a recommendation that we, that we provide more information to the public rather than less. Yes, agreed. And we'll have to talk through when, how that can happen and, and when we can get those cost estimates and, and, GHG reduction estimates and how, um, but yes, agreed that public input in a vacuum is is less helpful. Sam, I, I was going to really quickly um, say that I I totally agree, and I I tend to think of those as like phase two, and you have a one pager. I love embedding one pagers. I'm like, here's the state of things now when you're going to ask a question. Um, I think we did that with the say what on the, on the um, renewable energy standard update outreach, and, and that that worked really well and got a lot of good feedback, even folks that didn't want to participate at that time, still took away a lot of information and had great conversations. But I do think there are earlier questions we can ask about folks' experience of existing programs and um, and, and the rollout or, 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 or whatever. Um, a lot of people just want to share what the biggest issue is for them. And so I think asking that early is never going to hurt and, and might make them come back later to engage in that more sort of trade to education for for um, more specific uh, advice or recommendations or feedback um, later. So I think building that relationship early and often, I think, I think I'd think i really encourage us to do both. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I agree. Asking about people's experiences and, and asking them, you know, I don't, I, you know, maybe we don't need to come forward with funding recommendations initially, but okay, you you are supportive of this policy or expanding this policy. Uh, how would you suggest funding it? I mean, funding is something that I'm gonna continue to come back to as we formulate our, our recommendations because I think specificity there will, will be helpful. Um, not to cut conversation short, but Peter has been waiting patiently to <laughs> speak up on behalf of the electricity task group and then we'll save a few minutes for next steps. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, first, thank you to all the great work you all are doing, everyone else is doing to move the ball forward. This is this is good stuff. Um, our task group split into two um, mini groups to discuss the two revisions to the two pathways that fall under our charge. Uh, Liz Miller, Rich Cowart, and Sam Lash are taking on pathway two in the electric sector. And 
TJ, Poor, and I are taking on Pathway 3, mostly to revise language around energy storage. Um, Rich, you could say if your um, subgroup met, I know TJ and I were not able to. We actually found the exact time of non-overlapping vacations for each of us to take. The second I got back, TJ took off. So we don't have our, 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 our revisions ready. So, um, but we will obviously have something prepared well in advance of the Climate Council September meeting. I can report that we are in the same exact boat. Okay. Well, it's a fun boat, I guess. So we'll report out as soon as we get our materials together. Do you all, could you all just remind the subcommittee of what those pathways are? I think I can pull them up quickly if I need to, but if you um, have them off the top of your head. Sure. Um, pathway three is load management and grid optimization. Um, and uh, I don't have pathway two in front of me, unfortunately. It was enable all the monitors to choose electrification is the old is the older wording. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Great, thanks. Dave, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to cross cutting issues. I I had a, a quick chat with with Brahm and his uh, sidekicks in the transportation working group uh, the other day, um, because I'm concerned that um, I, I think that this group could be really effective in ensuring that we're actually actually managing EV charging in Vermont. Um, the PUC's Act 55 report to the legislature uh, wasn't especially clear um, as to uh, as to that situation. There are about 13,000, 12, between 12 and 13,000 EVs in Vermont and way less than a third of those are are being uh, controlled by uh, utility programs. Of course, if if you're not managing flexible electricity load, you're just raising costs. And um, that has implications for every Vermonter, and it has additional implications for low income, moderate income Vermonters who are just going to be faced with those costs because if you're not managing this, you're just more readily going to have to get more generation, update uh, and upgrade distribution trans uh, transmission. So anyway, I had this chat with the transportation folks and they said, you should go talk with the electricity folks. So I guess we're in pathway three with this. And I just I just want to raise this. What I'll do is provide you all with, you know, a one pager explaining what I think we can do about that. I have some suggestions for actions, but um, it behooves this organization to make sure that we're actually managing uh, EVs in this state. Great. Thank you, David. I really appreciate you you pitching in with that info. I'm sure me will be trying, we, we would want to incorporate that. So please send it along and we may be leaning on you for more details as well. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and please do send it um, to the folks for Pathway 2 as well. I know EV chargers were called out specifically in one of the previous strategies or actions. I don't know them off the top of my head. Sorry, I'll get there eventually, like Jared or something. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that, that would be great. Yeah, thanks for highlighting that that intersection with transportation as well. It sounds like load management might end up being a unique um, topic for the whole subcommittee to dive into, um, given that importance and the need to keep electricity affordable as a as an under um, overarching goal or really necessity for um, electrification. All right. Um, let's see. We were going to spend so. I think I mentioned we're going to table transportation till next time. Um, we were going to spend a quick minute on um, approach to non-energy emissions. Um, and then, well, what's the pleasure of the group? Do folks want to get into this agenda item of the preliminary results and assumptions on the clean heat standard potential study? Is there much to say there? I'm just trying to manage the remaining 12 minutes that we have. Seeing some nods. Okay. <laughs> Um, sorry, Jared, before we go there, I just remembered that, so approach to non-energy emissions should be quick. Brian, I think can spend one or two minutes on it. And that one is timely because we just need to know whether there are any folks who want to, um, generate a, a new task group there. Yeah, exactly. Last, for the last iteration, um, actually Peter Walk was the lead on this with Colin. 
uh, largely relates to um, management of uh, hydrofluorocarbons. And since there's not a dedicated task group right now, the Climate Af Action Office is, is willing to take the lead on this again, but we certainly welcome participation of anybody at cross sector, um, you know, as, as their capacity um, and their, you know, due to capacity and their interests. And we can just leave it at that. Sure, you, don't, you don't need to put your hand up right now. Just know that 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 we'll we'll commence that activity and uh, we'll we, we can be you know get into the report backs at future meetings. Um, but if you want to participate, just um, send an email to Jane. Yep, folks who want to be engaged over the next month in that work should reach out to Jane and Brian. Yep. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. Thank you, Jared. Go ahead. Yeah, just just on the point that Brian just left on, I was wondering if it would make sense to just go back and tie up a loose end from earlier in the meeting while we're um, focused on identifying interest in um, participating in different subcommittee activities, if um, it's worth pausing now to see um, which subcommittee members would want to be involved in um, uh, review of any uh, baseline or pathways modeling updates. Um, I know I certainly am, um, but I think it would be good because it sounds like we're not entirely sure, Brian, when the when the process will begin. So I'm assuming it would be helpful to you to know, you know, who the interested folks are if you quickly want to pull together a, a task group or a review group in terms of the work that will be happening there. Rich had his finger up. Yeah, anyone else interested in, in participating in a subgroup? I would love to be included, Jared, but I understand my appetite for participation is sometimes larger than can be accommodated. All right, yeah, thanks for flagging that. Working through my agenda. Okay, so yeah, I think we can spend maybe five minutes on this clean heat standard and potential study topic. Um, I haven't teed it up for discussion. And then I do wanna save five minutes, again, just to talk about logistics into, as we go into the spring. So um, Rich, is this something you wanna kind of tee up? No. Um, uh, anyone else wanna speak to the clean heat standard potential study? I My understanding is that there was a draft of some results presented to the technical advisory group to the clean heat standard. Um, and the department is in the process of soliciting feedback and integrating feedback. Um, again, this is a modeling exercise. And so there have been, I think a lot of the feedback is around assumptions in the model. I'm not sure if there's much more that I need to say on that, but um, Jared, did you want to add anything on? No, I, I think that that's, if, if folks are interested, um, I actually don't, know um what the website is to to review the slides that were pre presented by the um consultant that the public service department has hired um nv5 um i know that they were shared during uh the clean heat tag meeting but i think it's suffice to say there were a, there was a lot of feedback on uh, appropriate inputs and assumptions and um i think the Public Service Department was really um, great in terms of uh, welcoming and um, trying to incorporate, collect a list of that feedback very quickly so that they can then work with um, the consultant to revise as necessary a lot of the inputs and assumptions so that there can be an updated draft. So I, I can't say for sure, but based on what I heard during that meeting, it seems like there's going to be a lot of work to uh, revise and improve that model with uh, more up-to-date data. You know, for instance, it was using the old emissions inventory data rather than the one that just came out. Um, so um, I think at this point, you know, and the consultants were very clear. I think it said in all caps on the first uh, cover, the cover slide, and then in every slide throughout draft results, not for attribution or distribution that hasn't stopped um, some of the results from, from being, um, you know, uh, talked about, I, I, but I think the uh, 
the, the, the accurate way to describe it is that they were very draft and preliminary and are, are subject to significant revisions. So it probably makes sense to wait to discuss it more in depth until those revisions and a next draft is available. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. I'm not sure that the slides are posted. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll put in the chat our Clean Eat Standard uh, website, but I don't immediately see the slides actually. This, so this does include the email if one were to want to submit comments, but I don't know that the slides have actually been posted. And I don't know if the tag maintains its own website or not. Um, and the only other thing I can I can report is I, I've been told by the Clean Heat Standard team that um, there'll be revised um, results by the end of August. I believe that's the timeline so that the, the modeling is being revised um, currently. Melissa, do you know how those will be shared? Will that, will that, those revised results be shared during a clean heat tag meeting? I do not know that. Um, you'd have to ping TJ or Brian Cotterell are kind of the leads there. Um, okay. Brian just gave me the, the August 30th date yesterday. So um, I believe those will be shared through the PUC process, but. I'm a little bit removed from clean heat standard implementation. Um, definitely understand it's of interest to this group because as the buildings and thermal task group has discussed, we need to determine whether there's a plan B if uh, clean heat standard does not go forward. Um, so thanks all for sticking through uh, a two hour meeting again with us. I, I would love to just really um, wrap up with a focus on um, what we th see coming for the fall. Um, do we think monthly frequency is is going to work for this task group? Uh, do we want to consider meeting more frequently? I, I would welcome immediate reactions. And um, I wondered if there was appetite for any in-person meetings either. And so just open it up for discussion um, from you all. Looks like we're next scheduled to meet September 12th. I'm not opposed to an in-person meeting. I think they are helpful at least, you know, once once in a while. Yeah, I oh. Yeah, Christine, go ahead. Um I'm I think in-person meetings are great. I as long as we also have a hybrid solution um just for those of us that may not be physically present. Um the, ta the thermal task group has been meeting on a once a week um, basis, uh, maybe not, well, two to three times a month for the last couple of months. And we're envisioning once a week between now and September, given what we've been asked for by September. So from my perspective, to answer your question, Melissa, that feels where the rubber is meeting the road. And then a once a month convening of cross sector seems to be working for our work at this moment in time, in my opinion, but. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we certainly don't want to overburden people if they're meeting once weekly with task groups. Um, I, I see doubling up. Um, I do think we should keep it in mind as we go into the September, October timeframe where we're trying to do our prioritization and maybe the task group work will have slowed by then. We don't need to make that decision today. We'll keep the September meeting. Uh, Rich, go ahead. Agree with what you just said. Uh, the odds are pretty good we'll need to double up in October or something like that. But after we're we're we have more material in front of us. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, and just preliminarily, Rich and I will circle back on agendas for September. These meetings seem like they come around quickly, but um, you know, we're certainly going to want to hear from the transportation task group, and I expect that will be a pretty robust discussion. Um, and then we have this outstanding issue around load management and then um, framing up public engagement stakeholder meetings um, that will be happening in the fall. So I, I expect those three will be the focus and then anything else that materializes uh, in the next few weeks for that September meeting. So I think we'll, we'll probably stick with remote for September, but um, look forward to a potential hybrid option. And we should probably, we only have about half of our subcommittee here. So, um, hear the input from other folks in September and then probably talk about a potential location. Montpelier seems central, but I don't wanna have that bias either. We can travel wherever is um, easiest for most folks to access. Um, did I miss anything, Rich, or any last minute comments from the group? All right. 
Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate the level of discussion and dialogue today. Thanks, everyone. Melissa. Thanks, Melissa, everybody. And thank you, Melissa, for leading us. Appreciate it. Yeah. Take care. Thank you all.